All right, hi everyone. Uh, so today, um, uh, this is another book I ordered from Hungary, published by um, the uh, Research Center for Humanities in Budapest. Uh, they're, they've been publishing uh, a lot of books uh, in anticipation of the, the 500th anniversary of the Battle of uh, Mohács, um, which uh, a lot of it is in Hungarian, but one of the books that they published, you can see there on the screen, is this one uh, on the verge of a new era, the armies of Europe uh, at the time of the Battle of Mohács. It's edited by Janusz B. Szabó and Paul, uh, Paul Fodor. Um, great book, uh, but I'm going to, uh, and it covers a lot of different topics in, let's say, late medieval military history, uh, mostly from about the mid-15th century up to 1526. Uh, so there's, uh, there's part about Moscow, Muscovy, uh, you have, of course, the Ottomans, Ottoman military, article about, or chapter, I should say, about uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, uh, Hungary, of course, the Holy Roman Empire, Italy, uh, Switzerland, or the Swiss Confederation, France, Spain, um, Portugal, England, and Scotland, and then finally a, a chapter about Scandinavia. So all Pretty much every region of Europe uh, is covered. Um, all right, but I, I thought I read the chapter today about uh, Hungary. So I thought I would share uh, parts of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's like a 30-page chapter, but uh, I thought I'd just go ahead and read the sections that are would be interesting and helpful for uh, developing a wargaming army. So start with the there's a subsection about uh, the cavalry uh, the late 15th century laws on military service were the product of a period when the heavy cavalry held undisputed primacy on the battlefield this explains the great efforts made to increase the number of domestic heavy cavalry after the foreign mercenaries were discharged in 1493 Fully armored Hungarian troops, however, did not always stand up well, uh, stand up well in comparisons with their Western counterparts, and seem to have been less well equipped. According to Francesco de las Huechas report of 1500, the smallest unit of hun Hungarian cavalry consisted of six horsemen, uh, led by one in full armor, which roughly corresponds to the formations in Italian armies. The Elmetto or Coraza, more commonly, uh, more common by then than the Lance, in quotes. But surviving uh, Bandarium registers show that these units were very varied in Hungary, and we find examples of three or four horse units. According to Bonfini's contemporary description from the 1490s, I'll just stop here. Bonfini is the secretary to. Uh, the King Mat Mat Matias uh, Corvinus, um, the heavy cavalry was still fighting in closed squares, as in the time of Mat um, Matthias or, or Matias, but we do not know the tactics employed in the subsequent decades and whether any changes were made. After 1492, the peace of the Jagiellonian era did not favor the use of such an expensive branch of arms, only 24 of the 3,757 cavalry recruited to defend the southern border in 1523 were heavily armored, even though such troops were indispensable in combat with the Ottomans. Knights and armor were still crucial when an army fought a major engagement. The Ottoman chronicles record that lightly armored Ottoman cavalry, moving in loose formation, were almost incapable of halting a heavy cavalry charge. even in raids, when carried out on a large scale, required the presence of heavy cavalry. In Pal uh, Inigi's incursion into Serbia in 1494, for example, 
Bonfini records that the various cavalry units were coordinated by the following method. Quote, the enormous corps of armored horsemen were sent in advance in slow march as the guarantee for the whole campaign. In the center, as was custom in enemy territory, the soldiers placed their baggage in the meantime, uh, placed their baggage in the meantime, the light troops galloped far and wide, burning villages, looting houses, pillaging the land, driving up persons of any sex and age, together with their livestock, and gathering everything to the strong core of knights, end quote. Um, neither is it surprising that the light cavalry still featured prominently in the Banderia, together with their heavily armored counterparts. Their proportions were first stipulated at 50% in the Act in Act 21 of 1494, even though the Hussars, except in the 11 southern counties, were officially abolished in 1498, they were, uh, were officially abolished in 1498, theoretically making the heavy cavalry the bulk of the armed forces. The surviving registers show that this condition was never fully achieved, and at least 10% of the few known Bandaria were still Hussars. The problem shows up in the laws of the 1518 Buddha Diet, which prohibited the advance of Hussars at the expense of horsemen in full armor. Just taking a uh, drink of tea there. The increase in the number of troops required from the militia portalis also had the inevitable inevitable effect of lightening cavalry armor because under the old laws the troops raised on 20 households had always been like cavalry the decree the decree that increased the requirement to one soldier for every 10 households clearly states that the horsemen only needed to be equipped with lance and shield or with bow and quiver in 1518, the government specified that even wealthier nobles, with 50 to 100 peasants, were to equip them were uh, to quote uh, equip themselves as hussars with armor, i.e., mail shirt, a helmet, and diverse weapons. The weaponry of the Hungarian light cavalry at the time was a combination of lance and shield, highly typical of 16th century hussars. This enabled them to take up close combat similarly lightly armored Ottoman cavalry or with infantry. They were thus not confined to typical light cavalry duties and in the frontier region, despite fighting in, in traditional small loose formations, they could be effective as battle cavalry if required. As the old type heavy cavalry following the European trend was increasingly marginalized and completely disappeared in Hungary after 1540, was replaced by a second echelon medium cavalry that continued to be known abroad as the Hussar, but in, Greece, but in Hungarian were increasingly referred to as Katona, or Soldier, or Lovag, uh, Knight, occasionally as Kopjas Lovash, uh, Lancer Cavalrymen. The improved equipment of these troops enabled them to stand up to Ottoman cavalry, who were usually present in superior numbers. A slightly later example of the effectiveness of their devastating charge was the part played by the Hungarian Royal Hussars at the Battle of Schmalkalden in 1547. Uh, the Hungarian cavalry was a feared opponent of the Ottomans throughout the period. As long as they had effective uh, bridgeheads on the Danube and Saba, the Hungarians could pose a real threat to Ottoman-held areas. In the War of 1500-1503, Quote, the Venetian senators were greatly pleased to make an alliance with the king of Hungary, and it proved very beneficial because they had e heard even from Constantinople that the sultan took the feats of the Hungarians seriously and that this distracted his attention from elsewhere. The cavalry also fought effectively in Wallachia under Jan Sapoya in 1522. Infantry the laws governing the military organization give some guidance on the proportions of cavalry, but provide no hint of why infantry comprised half of the Hungarian army in 1526. Consequently, a plan of, for an army to attack the Ottomans 
compiled by an unknown Hungarian leader sometime between 1516 and 1518, is of particular value. It assigns a strikingly greater role to the infantry that is implied by the laws, envisaging an army of 10,000 men, of which 3,000 would be heavy cavalry, 3,000 light cavalry, and the remaining 4,000 infantry, half with arquebuses, and the other half with spears. This army was clearly intended for the offensive and presumably uh, for open field battle. The plan also tells us that the Archbishop of Estergom was required to provide 500 infantry, 300 hussars, and 200 heavy horsemen rather than the 800 horsemen specified in the 1498 law, and the Archbishop of Eger also legally obliged to keep 800 cavalry, was to bring 500 infantry, 200 hussars, and 200 heavy cavalry to the army. These figures presage records made in the 1520s. The Archbishop of uh, Calocha maintained 500 paid hussars and 300 paid infantry in 1523. And the king, previously required to provide 1,000 cavalry, sent a contingent of 1,000 inf infantry and 200 cavalry to the army, to army setting out to relieve Yacha or Yache in 1525. The relatively cheap arquebus bearing infantry is excellently suited for fighting the mainly cavalry armies optimized for long distances and low population density of, of eastern and of central and eastern Europe. It was effective in siege warfare. We do not know of any heavy, heavily armed infantry in the Hungarian militia portalis. Such troops show up only among soldiers hired by the towns. The few references to infantry in the laws concern only gunners, Ixidari, in fact, arquebusiers, as in the list of types of troops who may be mobilized for the army included in Act 11 of 1526. There were only three uh, categories, heavy cavalry, hussars, and handgunners. The traditional peasant weapon was the spear, but there were peasants from all parts of the country as shows up in the records for the year 1514, who used arquebuses in combat. Although the arquebus appears in Istvan Taurinius' epic poem, Theramachia, as the weapon of the noble army, used against the peasants armed with spears and bows and arrows hiding behind their shields, the Zemplen muster of 1526 records nobles joining the infantry uh, as bearing either arquebuses or spears. Another indication of the spread of firearms is that after the War of 1514, the government attempted to prohibit peasants from owning firearms. In spring 1526, after the Bestercebania Miners' Rebellion, miners were prohibited from entering the town with arquebus or other weapon. Not even national boundaries interrupt the spread of handheld firearms. A law had to be passed in Hungary in 1525 to prohibit the export of arquebuses to the Ottoman Empire. Swiss and German type offensive heavy infantry armed with pikes and halberds, often presented as typical in Hungarian literature, were hardly present in the Hungarian royal army. Bohemian Polish uh, Darabons, described by the Venetian diplomat Masaro as the best in Central Europe, quote, stand in armor from head to toe. Most of them have good arquebuses, others have sharp maces made of hard iron attached to a pole by a chain like a flail. They can give a blow that can bring down a man in armor. Some carry halberds and shields, when in com and when in combat, they always seek contest with the enemy, even if the latter is in superior number. In the 1526 campaign, Bohemian mercenaries who came to Buda were mostly arquebus-bearing shooters, scopitieri, or scopi scopetieri, along with pavis bearers, uh, targoni longi e grossi, uh, targoni grandi quanto uno pomo, and heavy infantry with pikes and pole arms, armati benissimi con mese pice, longo ferro, armate con mese pice. Polish and Czech historians state that only about 25% of these troops were heavily armored foot soldiers with pole arms and standing shields. Uh, Tarpiac in, uh, in 
Hungarian. 70-75% of them were 70 and, excuse me, and 70 to 75% of them tutors, among whom the Archibus had almost universally replaced the traditional crossbow by the end of the 15th century. The Bohemian and Polish infantry mercenaries in service, the Hungarian army thus had a much greater, uh, thus had much greater numerical firepower than the renowned Swiss or German infantry of the time, of which every fourth or fifth man carried a firearm even in the 1540s. The Bohemian mercenaries of the King and Count of uh, Sepesh were similarly equipped in the 1520s. The army, or excuse me, the family estates of the Sapoyas were spread throughout uh, through the northern counties of the country and in the proximity of Moravia enabled uh, Georg uh, Sapoya to recruit mercenaries from there, as he did in uh, 1514, and was rumored to have done in 1526. In 1527, the army of his brother King John was mentioned in Venetian reports as including uh, 500 Bohemian mercenaries. The artillery became an integral uh, artillery. The artillery became an, an integral part of the Hungarian army under King Sigismund, who for several decades had contended with the masterful deployment of guns by his Bohemian subjects. He established an artillery arsenal in Buda that operated continuously until 1526, and by the early 1500s was using the most advanced European techniques of gun casting. Heavy artillery pieces were usually taken by ship along the Danube to where they were needed, castle sieges and field battles. The use of firearms was not confined to the royal army. Towns and aristocrats also saw their potential, and the artillery left its mark on early 16th century Hungarian fortress architecture. Some sources put the number of large guns in the Hungarian camp at Mohács at 53, others at 85. Since there were approximately 27,000 troops in the army, the artillery was, was approximately in the proportion recommended by the renowned military writer Count uh, Reynard du uh, Zusolms in the mil middle of the century. He considered that an army of 20,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry should have 18 siege guns and 54 field guns. Hungarian field artillery at Mohac also included the not inconsider inconsiderable firepower of 500 to 600 uh, Prague arquebusy, arquebuses a croc. The walls of Vienna were defended uh, by only 360 arquebuses a croc, uh, 1557. Um, I'll stop there for a second. He doesn't explain, the author doesn't explain what those weapons are but i'm i'm guessing based on context it's some kind of like a wall musket or uh like a wall gun um uh, okay uh, tactics although the Jagalonians established their rule in 1490 by force of arms the din of battle subsided after 1494 and despite recurrent resumptions of the state of war there was no major national trial of strength until the Great Ottoman War erupted in 1521. The famous Polish general of the time, Jan Tarnowski, who also came to Hungary with the European armies that marched against the Ottomans in 1521, considered the strength of the Christian armies fighting the Turks uh, lay in their infantry. Hungarian tactics at the time, however, were certainly based on the cavalry, and it was the Hungarian heavy cavalry that the Ottomans themselves feared most, Ottoman chroniclers several times recorded worries about the irresistible armor-clad Hungarian heavy cavalry, and illustrators painted masses of armored knights in the manuscripts as if the Christians had no light cavalry similar to their own. The example of the neighboring Bohemians, however, prompted the Hungarians to assign an, in an increasing role to the artillery and to, the to infantry armed with crossbows overwhelming overwhelmingly after the turn of the 16th century, uh, handheld firearms. Even the use of war wagons was adapted in the Hungarian army. The infantry during this period never exceeded the cavalry in numbers. However, uh, uh, the infantry during this period never exceeded the cavalry in numbers, however, and, and only rarely made up more than a third of the army. The mass cavalry provided the Hungarian forces with great maneuverability uh, at tactical and operational levels. 
1526, for example, the Voivoda of Transylvania, uh, John Sapoya, asked the town of uh, Besterche for uh, mounted arquebusiers, effectively dragoons. They were capable of moving with the same rhythm as the cavalry, a novelty in Europe at this time. This mobility showed up well in Sirmia in 1523, for example, when the Hungarian king's 4,000 troops were victorious over a 10 to 12,000 strong Ottoman invading force, breaking them into units and destroying them one by one. Allegedly, only a few thousand attackers made it back to the south side of the Sava. Dominance of highly mobile field cavalry, cavalry also had disadvantages on the battlefield. In the middle of the 16th century, uh, Hieronym Faletti, an envoy of the Duke of Ferrara, wrote of the Hungarian-like cavalry, the Hussars, that, quote, when these soldiers engage, it is their custom to attack first with ferocious strength and take positions with audacious courage. They do not remain in formation side by side and instead wander in disarray so that when the enemy squadrons attack, they readily flee. Similarly to the light cavalry, lightly armed troops also had an important place in the infantry. A good example of flexible cooperation between infantry and cavalry is the Hungarian military expedition set up to resupply and ultimately succeeded in relieving, <coughs> relieving the besieged castle of uh, Yacha in 1525. In the mountainous terrain, the commander of the convoy, Count Krzysztof Brangepan, sent the mobile arquebusiers ahead to take the high points and secure the route of the slowly moving convoy. In this combat, even the hussars had to fight on foot. When the besieging Ottomans resolved to attack the relieving force, Brangepan's cavalry lured the Bosnian governor's cavalry onto the arquebusiers, who allegedly fired 500 rounds before the attackers ran off. The Hungarians thus broke through the encirclement and took supplies into the castle. It was only shortly afterwards that Sultan Suleiman, in one of the largest open battles of, in 16th century Europe, dealt the decisive blow to the Hungarian armies of Mohac. Louis II himself fell while fleeing after the defeat. The Battle of Mohac, uh, 29th of August, 1526. The Ottoman-Hungarian wars that resumed in 1521 came to a decisive climax at Mohac on the Danube on 29th of August, uh, 1526. That day, 12 to 13,000 cavalry and 12 to 13,000 infantry troops were concentrated on the Hungarian side, accompanied by 5,000 wagons and 15,000 draught horses. Their armory included 500 heavy Prague arquebusiers a crook and 85 cannons. At least another 15,000 Bohemian, Croatian, and Transylvanian troops were making their way toward Mohac, but they did not arrive in time to join Louis II, King of Hungary and Bohemia. Before the battle, uh, before the battle, even without them, however, this was one of the largest concentration of forces in the history of medieval Hungary. Nearly all the peoples of Central Europe were represented in the camp. Hungarians were joined by Croatians, by Croatian, Serbian, Slovak, Bohemian, German, and Polish troops. It was a very su substantial force by the standards of Europe at the time, but Sultan Suleiman's superb troops still outnumbered them by two to one. The Hungarians were arranged in two formations, arranged on their left flank uh, on the marshy floodplain of the Danube, and spread out widely to prevent the Ottoman army from extending beyond the right flank. Most of the infantry and, and light cavalry, some 15 to 20,000 troops, were arranged in two wings on the first formation. All the guns that had been unloaded in time from the Danube ships were placed between the light cavalry and the infantry. Behind these came a second formation, with the king at the center, surrounded by the, dignitar by the dignitaries and their units, and a thousand armored horsemen in the, at the rear. Lightly armored cavalry took up positions on each side of the second formation, with small infantry units defending the flanks. A small squadron of light cavalry was assigned to protect the king himself and cover his and cover his flight. 
Since there were, were hardly any infantry tr troops suited for offensive action, the original idea seems to have been for the powerful troops in the second formation to be held in reserve for a counterattack. This would have been an appropriate engagement for the infantry, who were mainly armed with arquebuses, crossbows, and bows, and were more at home in a defensive combat from a distance. The maneuvers performed by the Ottomans changed all this. Although preliminary skirmishes had been going on for three days, Suleiman was also preparing for battle on, 20, on, the, on 29th August. His forces made their way slowly over the difficult terrain for the already assembled Hungarian army. Leading the way was Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha's Rumelian Corps, reinforced with 4,000 Janissaries and 150 guns, and they only arrived at the edge of the plateau around the Mohach Plain around midday. Ibrahim Pasha's force of 30 to 40,000 troops was itself larger than the Hungarian army, but he decided that his army was too tired to fight. He therefore sent a 7 to 10,000 strong detachment of light cavalry to lie in ambush behind the Hungarians, ordering his other troops to wait in battle in battle order opposite the Hungarian right flank while the servants set up camp. The encircling maneuver was soon detected, however, in order to avoid breaking up the battle, Pal Tomori, the Bishop of Kalocha, Kalocha and Commander-in-Chief of the Christian forces, sent the King's Guard of lightly armored guard troops to reconnoiter the enemy. They engaged with the intruders, but they could not withstand the numerically superior Ottoman raiders, who went on to attack the Hungarian camp in the rear of the Hungarian army throughout the battle. Tomori and his fellow commanders were, un were convinced of the unlikelihood that Suleiman's whole army would arrive on the battlefield that day, but they, count they counted on an, Ot an Ottoman attack. Seeing how slowly the enemy was marching, however, and possi possibly observing the Vermilion troops making preparations for the camp, they decided that the battle should not be postponed and that the enemy should be provoked to attack before the rest of the army arrived. Uh, and just a brief Note of for context, the Rumelian Corps would have been the Ottoman army from the Balkans, basically. Uh, so the, the 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 European troops, if you will. Okay. Uh, continuing on with the with the excellent chapter. Uh, accordingly, at the time of Muslim afternoon prayers, the right flank of the first Hungarian formation, led by Ferenc uh, Batyani, Ban of Croatia launched an attack on the Ottomans. They drove, the, they drove off the Ottoman cavalry, covering the camp as far as the guns set up in the center of the Rumelian Corps, but the barricades set up in front of the guns deflected the attack. The Hungarian light cavalry turned away from the Janissaries defending the guns and wheeled around to face the Rumelian cavalry arranged alongside, breaking through the lines at several points. Some got even as far as breaking into the Ottoman camp, setting off a flight toward the Sultan. To follow up the success, the second formation also entered the fray and started to encircle the Rumelian Corps. The infantry of the right flank soon reached the guns. It, became, it soon became apparent, however, that the Hungarian commanders had delayed too long because Sultan Suleiman's entire army, after a forced march, was arriving on the battlefield. It spread out and its in its accustomed order, the court salary troops on the center around the Sultan and the Anatolian forces on the right. The Hungarian left flank held up in the new situation, but the armored cavalry of the second formation eventually abandoned their attack on the Rumelians. Most of them probably turned on the Anatolian corps, but in one section confronted the Sultan's retinue. The volleys of the Janissaries around the Sultan, however, forced the Hungarians back. In the words of the Ottoman chronicler Kemal Pashazadeh, Quote, three Ariman, uh, i.e. devilish-sized drunken knights holding sh shining lances broke through the lines standing in their way as a, as a bolt of lightning splits the cloud and appeared frighteningly before the sun of the sky of the caliphate, i.e. the sultan. The guards, however, brought them down. After the failed attack, troops started to flee the battle in increasing numbers, and the remnants of the Hungarian army broke in two. Most of the cavalry joined the left flank, while the completely encircled infantry of the right flank fought on, allegedly falling to the last man. The Hungarian forces gathered on the left flank, launched another assault onto the Anatolian Corps, but this desperate attempt failed, and the overwhelming superior Ottomans gradually forced the Hungarians onto the marshes of the Danube floodplain. 
the Bohemian and Polish professional infantry, assembled into a square, managed to repulse the Ottoman cavalry for a while, but were eventually uh, cut down by Janissary arquebus balls. The struggle went on until dusk and was ended by a sudden downpour. Any cavalry troops who were able, who were, who were able went into flight. Not believing they had finished off the Hungarian army, the Ottomans stayed at the ready all night, a sultan staying on his horse until midnight. In fact, they no longer had anything to fear. According to a report by Chancellor Bodorich, the Hungarian army, fighting a force several times larger than itself, lost four to 5,000 cavalrymen, and only 2,000 of the infantry remained alive. There were reports that 1,500 to 2,000 men had fallen into Ottoman captivity, and that they were systematically executed by the victors after the battle. The commanders of the two flanks escaped, but the commanders-in-chief of the Hungarian army fell, as did seven prelates and many aristocrats. Louis II disappeared in the chaos of the battle, and his fate emerged only later. In flight, his wounded horse had abandoned him in a marsh near the village of Cheshire, and he drowned in the water. The defeat decapitated the government of Hungary. The Sultan proceeded unopposed to Buda, and the only reason he did not make a vassal out of the conquered country was that there was nobody to surrender to him. As autumn came, he evacuated the city, which he considered impossible to defend, together with most of the Hungarian territory he had taken. Only in the strategically important Sirmia between the Danube and the Sava did he maintain an occupying force. The country, however, had lost much of its ability to resist. In 1527 and 1528, John I uh, reigned uh, 1526 to 1540. The king elected after Suleiman's withdrawal was unable to defend his throne from another claimant, Ferdinand of Habsburg, Archduke of Austria, who was much weaker than the Ottomans. Having started out in a position of more than 90% of territory of the kingdom, John was driven out hardly uh, in hardly more than six months, and in 1529 he finally put his fate in the hands of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, well, uh, I'll uh, stop there. Um, I, I covered most of the, the chapter, but uh, there's some introductory material um, and uh, and things like that that I, I skipped over. But uh, if you, I think this is a great book, um, and I'll have the link in the description of how to get it, which can be a little uh, complicated. Uh, so you can write to the research center and you can do like a like some kind of transfer to pay them bank transfer to pay them um and or you can um go on a website that i'll also put in the description uh a hungarian book website antiquarium.hu uh where you, that's where i got my copy um and um, i'm going to keep reading this uh, maybe I'll, I'll read one of the other chapters at some point um but uh, I, I just have to say, this really, I was thinking about doing an army, Hungarian army for Mohach to wargame that battle at some point. Uh, and this really changed um, my impressions of it because I guess I had, I, my, my kind of mental conception was I would mix like the newer, kind of newer at the time Renaissance style infantry with, um, with uh, like some of the older stuff. I was kind of thinking like there would still be some men at arms, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but, but based on, uh, this, uh, chapter, uh, that, that did not seem to be the case. So, um, yeah, so really interesting. Um, and I hope you guys found this informative. And, uh, like I said, if you, if you can, uh, order the book, I really recommend it. It's, it's really excellent. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's it's meant to be an academic title, but I think it's it's actually perfect for um, trying to build war game armies for this for this kind of late fifteenth, early sixteenth century period. So, um, yeah. Um, all right. Well, this has kind of been a long one, so I'll uh, stop there. Uh, thanks for watching or listening, and um, I'll talk to you guys in the next video.